Hi, I am Peter Reveal, and I'm excited to be here to share with you some of the latest advances in artificial intelligence and robotics. Myself, I've spent the last 20 something years as an AI robotics researcher, educator, and entrepreneur. And a lot has happened in AI robotics in the last few years. In this session, I kind of want to frame it around the question of when and how AI robotics will start making it into our worlds. Now, if you watch movies, you might have seen the Hollywood version of this. Maybe you've watched the Terminator movies or Westworld, or maybe something more positive and more aligned with how I think and hope it'll go, Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. And some of you might be thinking, hold on, wait a minute, don't we already have robots? Don't robots build our cars, for example? And indeed, robots actually build our cars. And it's amazing to see that in action. But here in this session, I want to make a distinction between traditional robotics, as we see in car factories, where robots go through dedicated pre-programmed motions over and over and over, and AI robotics, where a robot would have to look at what's in front of it and make decisions based on what it's seeing. And so the question I'd really like to think about here with you is, when will AI robotics make it into our worlds? Robots that don't just repeat motions, but see what's around them, react to it. Now, spoiler alert, I think that AI robotics very quietly, much under the radar, actually made it into our worlds in 2020. What we're watching here is a robot doing order picking at a warehouse in Berlin. And to be able to do this successfully, this robot has to see what's in front of it, understand what it means to pick one item at a time out of that blue bin and then place it into the outbound shipping box. This is AI robotics in action and helping fulfill orders when you order something online. But that was jumping ahead a little bit. Let's take a step back for a moment and think about what are the recent fundamental breakthroughs that we've seen in AI robotics? Why is operating in the real world still so difficult? And what's the path forward here? Let's take a look at what's on this slide over here. What do you see? You see a picture of a person. You might even recognize them. But what does a computer see? What if you want a computer to understand what's in the image? Well, the computer sees a bunch of numbers. And so for a computer to understand what's in that image, it somehow needs to process these numbers and turn it into some conclusion. Now, if you are an engineer trying to build such a system, you might maybe write, if this number bigger than that number, then it's a person, otherwise maybe it's a coffee mug and so forth. People try that for a long time, but these more traditional programming approaches don't really work for this kind of computer vision problem. So what does work? Well, it turns out that the approach that works is much inspired by the human brain. Now, to be fair, we don't really know exactly how the brain works, but still, a lot of inspiration is drawn from it. The way it's done today is when an image comes in, it gets processed by a neural network, which is shown in the middle of the slide here. This neural network in the first layer has the pixels of the image, then passes on processed version of that information to the next layer, next layer, next layer, and finally outputs a decision. In this case, we would hope the neural network fires on dog because there's a dog in the image. But what will it fire on? What determines what this neural network fires on? It turns out it depends on how the network is wired together and how strong these connections are. Strength is often referred to as the weights on those connections. So then you might say, okay, so then what we need to do is to just wire up this network such that it makes the right decision, 
But that's actually really hard to do by hand. In a realistic network, there will be millions, if not billions of these connections. So you can't go in and by hand rewire this till you have a solution. So how do we find the right wiring of this network so that calculation happening in the network is indeed giving us the answer we want? It turns out this is done through machine learning. More specifically, what is done, you first collect a bunch of example images. In this case, images of cars, images of cats, images of dogs. And then you take these example images and you feed them into the network. And so in this case, dog might be fed into the network. The network will process that. But initially, you don't know how to wire up this network. So it might not make the right decision. It might say cat. But if it says the wrong thing, that's OK. It's still being trained. A backward propagation happens in the network that rewires the connections such that it now better understands that this was a dog. And then we keep repeating this over and over and over and over. And if you feed it enough examples, and that's a lot of examples typically, at some point, something magical happens. It starts understanding what's in those images. And then when you feed it a new image, maybe of a cat, a car, or a dog, it'll actually understand what's in that image. Now, you might wonder, how big of a deal is it to use these neural networks for understanding what's in images? And how does it compare to what was there before? Well, this is a long-standing problem in computer vision. And there is a, a worldwide competition called ImageNet. In ImageNet, the organizers have a secret stash of images. Nobody else has access to those images. And to participate in the competition, you send in your computer program, and then the organizers will run your program on all their images and report back out the error rate of your program. You can see here that the best program that was sent in in 2010 had an error rate of recognizing what's in those images of 30%. So 30% of the time made the wrong decision. And then we see that with traditional computer vision, actually, this was not getting much better in 2011, 2012. But then something really special happened. In 2012, out of Jeff Hinton's lab at the University of Toronto, it was shown that instead of using traditional computer vision, if you use deep learning, where a deep neural network is trained to recognize what's in images from many, many examples, as we saw on the previous slide, you can actually cut the error rate in half. This was a massive breakthrough. People realized that this new approach is becoming the way to go. And as you can see in the future in the competition, people switched to deep learning approaches and the error rate quickly decreased. And in fact, by now this competition has been retired because human level error rates have been achieved. Now, to be clear, there is no computer vision system yet that can recognize everything as well as humans. But in the context of this competition, human level error rates were achieved, which was a lot of progress very, very quickly compared to what was happening before. Now, understanding what's in front of it is the first thing for a robot to do. But the next thing would be to then act and try to achieve some goal. And typically, the way this works is the robot would see what's in front of it, take an action, the world would change as a consequence. The robot would observe that, again, understand what's in front of it, and take another action, keep repeating this until ultimately it achieves its goal. Now, this is not just for robots. This is really for any AI system that needs to achieve goals. There's this repeated process of observing the world and taking action based on the current situation. There is a field within AI called deep reinforcement learning, which is concerned with how you can make robots and more generally AI systems learn to make decisions. Probably the most famous result that you might have heard of coming from deep reinforcement learning was AlphaGo out of DeepMind. AlphaGo was the first computer player to beat the human world champion in Go. This was a big surprise. People had not predicted this happening anytime soon, but thanks to deep reinforcement learning, this was all of a sudden possible in 2015. Now, DeepMind actually applied the same ideas to enable a computer to learn to play video games. 
While DeepMind was working on deep reinforcement learning for video games and the game of Go, in my lab at Berkeley, we were working on the same kinds of ideas, deep reinforcement learning, but to see if we can enable robots to learn new skills. Now, so far in this session, we haven't really seen any learning in action. I've talked a lot about results of learning, but I've not shown you learning happening. Now let's take a look at what happens during the learning. So we have a robot here, and we want this robot to learn to run. But this robot is controlled by a neural network, and the neural network, we don't know how to wire it up. It has too many connections for us to wire up by hand. So when we start it off, it's kind of randomly wired up, and it's not gonna know how to make the right decisions. And in fact, it's gonna fall over. But it's gonna introduce some randomness in these decisions. And then sometimes I'll be a bit more lucky and fall over just a little bit later. And when that happens, it's gonna do a back propagation in the network to rewire it to make that lucky outcome more likely to happen again. And that's what we're seeing in action here. And this process repeats over and over and over. And over time, in this case, after 2000 back propagation updates to the network, it actually has learned how to run. Now, the real interesting thing here is that this same algorithm that trains the two-legged robot to learn to run can then be run on another robot, a four-legged robot, it learns to run. Now, we can run the same code on the two-legged robot again, and it learns to get up. And in fact, we've run that same code on the Atari games we saw earlier, and it will learn to play the games. For this robot that we're seeing here, Learning to run is one thing, but actually we've been able to have it acquire a very wide range of skills, as you're seeing here. And at this point, this becomes very useful for, let's say, design of video games or making animated movies. Now, how about real robots? What we're watching here is Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. And Brett is learning to put the block into the matching opening. And in about one hour of trial and error learning, Brett figures it out and puts the block into the matching opening. Now, at first you might say, one hour is long, I can do it on first attempt, and I bet you can. But keep, keep in mind that this robot is starting from scratch, has not learned anything before. Whereas when you try it, you've done many, many similar things before in your life. And so there's a variant on something you've done in the past. Maybe you've even done this specific thing in the past. This robot starts from nothing and in one hour figures it all out, learns a vision system and a control system to solve this problem. Now the postdoc who led this work in my lab then went on to Google and scaled this up. He said, well, if a robot learns from its own experience, the more robots we have, the more data we can collect, the more experience to learn from. And indeed, it turns out the more robots you have, the faster learning can happen. Why? The robots can share their data, they can also share their neural network. It's often called fleet learning, and the larger your fleet, the faster the learning can happen. In this case, learning to pick up objects. Somewhat recently, at OpenAI, I was shown that you can use the same ideas, deep reinforcement learning, to have a robot hand learn to solve the Rubik's Cube. It's a very hard task to do in-hand manipulation. Very high dimensional problem, complicated contact forces, yet they showed it possible. We just covered a wide range of amazing breakthroughs in AI robotics, where robots are seeing, acting based on what they see, learning on their own to complete a lot of these tasks. But everything we saw was either in simulation or in a lab environment. How about taking this into the real world? There's a pretty big gap still between what we're seeing in research demos and what's needed for the real world. When we think about research progress, we think about doing something that's never been done before, going zero to one. And then once we've done that, maybe we try to improve it a bit, make it more reliable, but often once we have 70% success rate, we move on to the next thing, the next thing that can go zero to one. And that, that's okay. That's what research is all about, showing things that's never happened before. But for the real world, that's not good enough. If you wanna put an AI robotic solution into the world, it has to be reliable. 
and not even 90% is good enough. Let me, let me double click for a moment on the not even 90% is good enough. When you put a robot in the real world, the economics of that robot matter. You want this robot to create value. Now, let's say you have a robot and your robot is 90% reliable. Then if it operates at 500 per hour, it means it makes an error roughly every minute. Now, what good is a robot that makes an error every minute? Since fixing up errors often takes a lot more time than just doing the work, you might actually need two humans to manage this one robot. So yeah, that doesn't make much sense. At 95%, the errors are about two minutes apart. So now maybe one human is enough to manage the robot. But that's still, in terms of great economic value, probably a loss. But now, if we can go above 95%, we can start creating real value. For example, if we can hit 99% reliability, then the errors are about 10 minutes apart. And one human can start managing several robots. And of course, the higher the reliability, the larger the robot fleet one person can manage. The numbers I used are just an example, and the details of the math will of course vary a bit across use cases. But the absolute need for high reliability in the real world, that right there is the fundamental gap between lab and real world. Now, if you're familiar with you know, a lot of the progress in AI recently, especially deep learning, you might say, okay, okay, you know, we need to go beyond 90%. Well, naively, you might say, well, huh, we just set up a larger network, uh, we collect more data, we train it longer, and it'll get better. And indeed, in many research benchmarks, that is exactly what happened. But for the real world problems, there's actually some additional complications. Let me highlight those. Here are some subtleties in going beyond 90% for real world problems. First, we cannot ignore the long tail of real world scenarios. Second, we cannot ignore that the real world is always changing. Third, we cannot ignore that it's important to know when we don't know. Let me double click on each one of those for a moment. What do I mean? Real world is high variability, long tail. What's different from research? Well, in research, let's say you have a benchmark and maybe the benchmark is image recognition. You have a thousand categories. Let's say you want to do better at recognizing those thousand categories. You can collect more images of those thousand categories. And at some point you have so much data, you characterized each category and your neural net, you know, does really, really well. Now, if we go to the real world, there's not just a thousand categories, and millions of categories. Some of these categories have objects that are transparent. Uh, there's an unknown variation happening within each category. And there's this long tail of things that don't occur very frequently individually, but there's so many of these infrequent items that together, they add up to the robot encountering those infrequent items a lot and being very important to understand them. Second, in the real world, things are always changing. So compare that to the scenario on the left. Here you see a robot learn to run. Very exciting result that this robot can learn to run, but it's always flat, nothing's changing. On the right, you're in a warehouse, you're opening a box that just arrived. You have to decant it. Now what's in there? How is it packed? It's always gonna be something new, packed differently. And so you need to adapt on the fly to whatever you are dealt. And that requires new research. Another thing that happens in the real world is that you can encounter things that are just ambiguous, where you just don't know what to do. And it's very important if you're going to deploy AI robotic systems that they don't just make their best guess at something, but when something is ambiguous, something that they can't understand, that they Take pause, maybe call back on a human operator who might be able to you know, give some feedback and help the AI robotic system decide what to do. Now with this new knowledge in mind, it might not be too surprising that even though we've been promised self-driving cars for many, many years, it's still a big challenge ahead of us to make that happen. But now let's circle back to our original question when and how will AI robots make their way into our worlds? 
Well, as I briefly alluded to in the beginning of this session, what we're watching here is the beginning of the next generation of robots, AI robots, helping us out, in this case, helping with order fulfillment in a warehouse. When you order something online, that item has to be retrieved from the warehouse, then has to be packed. This robot is picking it out of the blue storage toad and then putting it into the uh, shipping box that then gets shipped off to whoever ordered the item. You can see this robot diligently picking one item at a time and fulfilling orders. This is a very hard problem. The robot has to see what's there, will be faced with new situations, uh, things it's never seen before, yet is expected to reliably pick one item at a time. And this started becoming possible in 2020. Now what we're watching here is actually uh, powered by what we call the Coverant Brain, built at Coverant, a company uh, we started about three years ago. And in fact, the press has been following the Coverant efforts quite closely. But this is all part of a much bigger trend. Big companies like Amazon and ABB, they are pursuing robotic order fulfillment. And many, many startups, in addition to Covariant, are pursuing this challenge. I see this all as a part of a big shared vision that the starting point, the entry point of AI robotics into the real world is going to be robotic order fulfillment in warehouses, and it just started. Now, of course, it's very, very exciting to have robots starting to fulfill orders in warehouses, but in wrapping up here, I wanna zoom out a little bit again and think again about the technology under the hood that we talked about. What's powering these robots? Well, as you might remember, these robots are trained. They learn to see. They learn to react to what's around them. They keep training and getting better over time. But these ideas are not specific at all to order fulfillment. In fact, these ideas are very general. And I anticipate that in the near future, we'll see these same AI robotics ideas power many new applications. Next might be farming, or maybe cooking, or maybe manufacturing of clothing or electronics, or maybe recycling. I think we're at the very beginning of AI robotics having a very big, real impact on our lives. Now, circling back to the very beginning where I mentioned Rosie the robot from the Jetsons, of course, you might still be curious, when are we gonna get a Rosie the robot to help us in our homes? Well, our homes have a lot less structure than the application domains I described so far. So I do think it's a harder problem and it's still quite a bit out there before we'll see that happen. That said, the AI robotics technologies that we covered in this session, I think those same technologies will carry over and will be at the core of what will power our future home robots.